cool. Yeah. See, there's way way more weathering on, uh, you know, rocks that are uh, out, outcrops and formations and um, on land because rain is going to erode a lot faster than sitting in seawater. So we have a lot of these. You can see where these uh, lava flows have moved. Can we actually get a zoom on that coral right there? Oh. I think uh, this is umbellopathies. Umbellopathies. Is that a black coral? Oh, uh, I believe so. Um, I only know the umbellopathies part because I've seen it before. I just can see a kind of a dark skeleton in there. Um, it I might be. It has yeah. a slight darkness to it. I guess look it up too. <laughs> yeah, don't write that down. That's just me asking. I don't really know. Oh, well, Mike said it was a black coral. <laughs> That's not a good reference. <laughs> In general, it's a Pitharian. Yeah, or it is black coral. Cool. Oh, low grade flow. Oh yeah, oh yeah, I can kind of see that. Low bait with pillow, lava well. mixture. Because I can't tell if some of these possible pillow lavas, the creases in it from the low bait flow got filled in with the sediment. But there are some that look like low bait. Yeah. So this is the first first dive on the seamount, just for general awareness. Yeah. Um, and as uh, we just mapped it yesterday for the first time, so that's another exciting aspect of exploration. Is we literally finished mapping this yesterday evening after dinner, um, and we're the first dive on this. Uh, yeah. No, that's a great point. That no one's ever seen this, which is pretty cool. And it's a little bit light on biology, and, and, you know, and that's relative to the ones we had a couple days ago that were crazy. Um, but it's, it has some really cool uh, rock uh, formations. Definitely. Yeah, and then like, it is interesting to see how different it's shaped from some of the other seamounts we've been mapping yeah. recently. It yeah. just doesn't have those big, really distinct ridge features. Um, yeah, I wonder if it's... More symmetrical, all of that. Yeah, like it's uh, much more of a subdued... It's uh, a ridge. Can we also get a it's zoom a on some oh. of these yellow corals? It's a conical shaped seamount. Yeah. yeah. So it's t this is like typical of what you of a volcano on the terrestrial on land. Oh, okay. Huh. Bamboo. <laughs> Go for zoom. Yep, that's a bamboo for sure. Just a little baby. <laughs> it looks like pasta. Like, <laughs> <It's> like pasta. <laughs> <laughs> I am not sure what this one is. I'm trying to count the polyps. Oh, that needs max zoom. Yeah, that is max zoom. Oh, okay. We're too far away. Yep. Uh, okay. Just a oh, rat tail. You pick up. You can get closer to a different one. Uh, Steve says it's a steropathies. Steropathies. Thank you, Steve. I like my pronunciation better. Mine, 
It could be potato. Uh, scientific names are potato, potato. So your interpretation is also okay. correct. I'm just pronouncing how like the ancient Greeks would have. Steropathies, steropathies. Go and resume there. <laughs> Go and resume there. That's a much better zoom. It's very pretty. Yeah, it's a lot more flexible than the hemichorallium, too. All right, thank you. Thank you, uh, Steve. So for those of you just joining us, we are currently in Papahanao Mokuakea Marine National Monument. Um, not too far from Holaniku or Kure Atoll, which is the oldest island in the uh, Hawaiian archipelago that's above the surface of the ocean. About 28 million years old is our oldest island, Holaniku. And we are currently on the Ala Aumoana Kaiuli expedition. Ala Aumoana Kaiuli uh, refers to the path of the deep sea travelers, which is what we've been doing over the last two and a half weeks, exploring the depths of Kanaloa, the ocean. And Kanaloa refers to our ocean deity um, for Kanako Oivi. The ocean is considered um, as one of our deities, a sacred place. So for those of you who are interested in the name Papahanao Mokuakea, um, it's a name that was given um, to this area by several um, kupuna, um, Native Hawaiian elders, um, who wanted to honor this, um, the ocean depths and also the emergent lands that make up Papahanao Mokuakea. And it refers to our goddess, um, Papahanao Moku, she that births islands, and Wakia, who is our sky father. And the union of these two deities gave rise to the islands and also to the Kanako O'ivi, the native Hawaiian people of this place. Bamboo coral? Yes, very big bamboo coral. Has a couple associates. I see some brittle stars. I saw a purple crinoid earlier. I see what look like to be some barnacle associates as well on the dead parts. Miss Malia, what is squid in Hawaiian? Squid. Let me think about that one. Octopus is he'e. Squid is pa he'e. Pa he'e. And in Hawaii, people call octopus squid. <laughs> Because I was noticing on when they first, when Hercules was going down, at, there was a lot of um, squidding and a lot of squids on the way down. Mm -hmm. And I was just wondering what the, the word for that, because we haven't seen it, but like, pahahe? Pa, P-A. P-A. H-E. H-E. And then um, the okina, the apostrophe that kind of looks backwards, and then yes. E. Pahe. 
<laughs> yeah, so squid is like one of the uh, top um, prey items for the Laysan albatross or the moli. Oh. So they kind of fly really high up and that's, you know, one of the main things we'll find in their diet is squid. Well, are, are, were the birds that were follow, like following us, do you know what they are? The boobies? So they're different than the albatross? Yeah, okay. yeah. Yeah, the um, Popahanaumokuakea has like over 26 different seabird species or actually bird species that make their home on the 10 different islands that are above the surface of the ocean. And we have over a million seabirds that make their home on um, Kuai Helani, which is midway. Mm. So there's a pretty cool, like every year volunteers come out and they do um, counts of the nests of the um, different seabirds there. So it's a really cool opportunity for people. They usually it's between like November and February. So you kind of have to commit to, you know, several months, but you get to do an amazing job and be able to help kind of um, inventory the seabird population on the island. That, I wonder how long it takes them to count. <laughs> yeah, well, they normally want to get it done quickly because uh, that's the nesting period. Mm -hmm. So I would, I would guesstimate between like a month and a half, two months. Wow. Bridge now. Can we please alter our bearing to 315? Thank you. I would be nervous to go around all those birds with their, with their nests. I feel like they'd be really protective about the people coming to count. Oh yeah, from yeah. From the people. And these are big birds. Oh my gosh, scary. Some of them have like wingspans of like six to seven feet. That's bigger than me. <laughs> <laughs> I missed the start of that conversation. What birds are we talking about? Um, the moli, the laysan albatross. Oh yes. Because they, we were talking about pahe'e or squid. That's like their main prey item. And so it evolved into conversing about the birds and where they live and where they nest. And they usually just have one egg. And oh, these birds mate for life. So they do this really cool dance. So they usually return to um, Kuai Helani every year around November, our Makahiki season. And um, they do this ritual, this like courtship ritual, and that's how they recognize each other. So every year they peer back up and then they have a single egg. And then they help, they both, the, the male and the female both help to, to care for the egg. And then one goes out to gather food, which is pahe'e, squid mostly. Um, and then they'll come back. And then the other one will go out and these are long ranging animals, like they're incredible. I think MIT actually looked at the structure of their wings to create like a glider wow. based on the, the just incredible design of these birds and the way they can soar. So yeah, like I always say, nature is like the best designer. Yeah. No doubt. I think about that when we see a lot of these interesting glass sponge structures. Um, I think they could inform some pretty amazing designs for, for building um, mm -hmm. or something where you need a lot of strength. Uh huh. It'd be kind of cool to like 3D print some of these lattices that the sponges make. Oh, that would be that really cool. That would be. And then like have students like figure out those structural components and the strength and that could be amazing. Great research project. And they could like guess like what organism the lattice is from. Wow. That'd be awesome. And can we use that, you know, in our design? 
I feel like I have heard about that before, how sponges influence something like that. I feel like I have too, I just can't think of what yeah. it was. Go over Zoom. Maybe it's something pertaining to like filtration because they're such good. This is just a Walteria sponge. Might be dying. Wonder what the bright red is though. Bright red? On oh, this okay. rock. It's a, uh, is it a mushroom coral? What is that? Might be mushroom coral. Okay. It's a little more redder, though. Okay. Oh, no. It's a little too small to make a good ID. What are you finding, Hannah? Were you thinking about, like, the lattice structure on a sponge? being like inspiration for designing yeah i just found a um a article that says how sea sponges can influence modern architecture it was mm. written in 2017 but I, i'll i'm gonna read it real fast and see what it says where is that published um australiangeographic.com cool i must have read that at some point <laughs> That was an interesting idea. It kind of reminds me of um, how people use plants to clean up pollutants. Like over in um, Waikiki, the Alawai Canal, they're doing this project um, where they're doing like bioremediation, which uses like living organisms to remove pollutants. That's cool. Yeah, one of my good friends is uh, at, at the University of New Hampshire, there's this place called the Stormwater Center, and their whole research focus is like removing pollution from sort of developed areas before it reaches, you know, rivers and streams and lakes and stuff like that or the ocean um, and so they do a lot of work with like natural um, they call them like gravel wetlands or rain gardens where the in the east coast we use or a lot of the oyster farms have a dual use where they they filter out like thousands and thousands of gallons of seawater the oysters yeah shellfish mm -hmm. are, are amazing yeah. Have you guys seen those videos of them? They just put oysters in a cloudy tank. It's a cloudy tank and just a, how fast it actually circulates and cleans out the water. Yeah. Oh, I have that's not cool. Seen no, that I have I haven't seen that, but that's a uh, that's great. That doesn't it doesn't surprise me. They're pretty efficient with their how they filter stuff. And what are we this looking the, at here? This is a large plate like glass sponge. I'm also very curious about the tall stalk in the back that we can't quite see yet, but let's take a look at this plate sponge first. Oh, it's a large bolosomid. It's a, sorry, it's a what? Bolosomid sponge. I'm large. wondering if it's the ET sponge. We go from right angle. I hope so. <laughs> I saw the oh, front. Oh, the, the, we're on the tall one now, okay. Yeah. And I was hoping it is. It's, uh, that's really tall. <laughs> Like, I'm amazed that, you know, we saw evidence, strong evidence of currents earlier. I'm just amazed that it's able to stand up this tall and not be knocked over. They have some very good structural components, as um, Hannah just let us know. anything good Hannah? So I read that one and it didn't get me what I wanted. Oh. 
I'm looking up how sponge structures influence modern architecture. This one I'm reading right now is in was published in 2020 and they interviewed people from Harvard, so I guess it might be better. I don't know. Well, that's where our biological specimens end up. Yeah. Publicly available repository there. Harvard Museum of Comparative Zoology. And uh, what, what I really like about that is it's not just the samples that go there. Uh, it's that all of the metadata from from the Nautilus cruises, like where it was collected, depth, uh, screen captures, um, all of that information is is sent with it. And so there's a, I'm sure it takes them a little while to process it, but it, you know it's it's available in their archive online, so researchers can uh, can find can find these specimens. They're not just kind of like you know, in storage forever. They're, they're actually accessible and information about them is, is readily available so that people who don't even necessarily need to know about Nautilus, though they should, but they don't need to, to, to use these samples, they're, they're completely, um, you know, available for researchers. Are they, is it available to like non-researchers as well? Like people who just want to look at what what has been collected and yeah I don't know I don't know um, how that works like if you need some sort of reason to go or academic credential or something I, I haven't attempted to use any of it um, I'm sure there's some sort of process um, but but I yeah I don't know what that is yeah the Harvard that paper that I just read it was really short but in 2020 Harvard did many models of one of the sponges just to test how resistant it was to being like moved around and it performed it outshone outshined all the other structures that they remodeled and so they want to take that into building bridges or just other types of structures so it is sponges um Scalp, like makeup does help like with engineering and building good things. <laughs> I don't know how to Yeah. That's I, cool. Material science yeah. kind of stuff. I wonder if they use utilize this because like for me Singapore is like one of those really progressive countries. Like when it comes to building and sustainability and really kind of that really smart um, you know, thinking about the future. Oh, that's, I didn't know that. And that's cool. Yeah, Singapore is really like one of those models because they have a very limited land base. And so they've got to think outside the box. Yeah. So I wonder if they're, they're utilizing nature as a foundation of design. Kara was actually just showing me pictures of Singapore the other day from a recent trip that she took, and oh. yeah. she was just saying how amazed she was about just like the buildings and how it like even when you were in the city it just still felt like you were like in the jungle. Mm -hmm. And oh, it wasn't until I looked at like pictures that I was like, oh wow, I don't know what I thought. Yeah, they're supposed to have one of the most amazing airports too. Oh. I've heard <laughs> that. Changi is amazing. Heard that, yeah. yeah. We used to do a lot of work out in a neighborhood called Luoyang, which is not far from Changi. It's uh, so almost at the end of the MRT line. Is there anywhere you haven't been, Ed? Uh, uh, South America and Africa. We have a map at home that we pin up, put pins where we where we've been, and you start to just see where you haven't been. Sure. <laughs> Funny, every time we say that, I think of one of our video engineers who has a nickname of Shrimp. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she's just wrapping up a three-week-plus trip to Egypt. Oh, wow. Is that an urchin? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah.
Ed, where are some of your favorite places to travel to, like not for work, for like fun or for vacation? Oh, man. Uh, <laughs> I kind of love it all. Uh, I mean, I, I really love the time we spent on Morea in French Polynesia. Mm. That was pretty awesome. Um, I uh, frequent Ireland way too often. Uh, really enjoy that. Iceland. That's on my list. Yeah, yeah. I'd love to go to Iceland. Yeah. Um, they're having a sale right now. Iceland Air, 439. Um, ding. Uh, what else do I really like? I don't know. Just kind of like the next trip. Love planning trips. Mm -hmm. um, love culture. I love always having something to look forward to. Yeah, the pandemic was has been kind of a bummer about that. Yeah, and I mean travels come back, but it's still yeah. a little questionable. Some sometimes. Um, you know, it's still a little lingering, so, and I think a lot of those, yep. you know, you just don't feel like you, you can book stuff six months or more out. You're just kind of like, well, yeah. you know, I think, I think it'll take a little bit, a few more years for us to really come back completely. Um, we've only been to New Orleans once, but that was a lot of fun. That's where our daughter goes when uh, she meets up with her friends. They're scattered all over the planet, but they usually go to New Orleans Great to get nap. together. That's sweet. I would like to go back to Louisiana because I was born there and only lived there for like nine months. And like have we have so back. much Louisiana on this ship. So. It's amazing. Yeah, represent. <laughs> no, Meg really. Represent. Megan was also Louisiana. born in Louisiana. Yeah, she was. Yeah. Who was? Megan. Megan. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> so random. When I go to Louisiana, where should I go? Hannah first. I mean, we have amazing representation from Hawaiians on board. I didn't realize we had, we had yeah. unintentional representation from Louisiana. Yeah, uh, there's a rivalry there. Hawaii, I Louisiana. Guess so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the uh, subpopulation of Seattleites. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, where would I go? Where would I suggest somebody to go in Louisiana? Uh, oh, I know. <laughs> I know. If you go during the winter, go to City Park. They usually have, like, you can drive around and they have all these Christmas lights out. So it's like a parade. Not, not like a parade, but it's it's so cool because there's so many lights and you get to drive through it. And they have, like, a radio station that you can put on to, like, sync up with the, the lights while you drive around. Oh. And also, <laughs> I guess. For food wise, if I was in New Orleans, um, yeah, okay. So, and then food wise, I would definitely go to the Napoleon House, which is off of Bourbon Street. So, in the French Quarter, it's super cool, it's super old. It's where Napoleon was supposed to live when he was in New Orleans, but he, he never got he never got there. <laughs> but, um, that restaurant they have great. Great red beans and rice, love it. And then I don't know my obviously cafe, but uh, cafe, oh, yeah. cafe du Monde. That's so good, I think and it's so I've cheap. Been, I think I've been there. It's so good. Um, yeah, and wear a black shirt if you go there. Yeah, don't wear a black <laughs> shirt. You'll get powdered sugar everywhere. Ah, uh, <laughs> danger sugar. <laughs> Now the yeah. music in New Orleans must be amazing. Oh, uh, it's so great. Yeah. Constant. Don't they have like festivals? Like the, there's like a jazz festival? Yeah, jazz like fest. something big. Yeah. yeah, jazz and heritage festival. There's nice. also um, Hogs for Cause, which is kind of... What's that in the water comp? Worm? It's kind of like a... Oh, oh. you can eat Yeah. yeah. A what? You, you're on mute. We'll go for Looks like a swimming polychaete. Swimming polychaete. Polychae. Yeah, coming in. Got you now. Wow. Oh, those things are cool. Ooh. They're like ocean centipedes. I, I love how they swim. Look we at all these rocks. That's like kind of like <laughs> golden iridescence, too. Uh -huh. 
They're sending a wave along there. Well, like we're zoomed in. Once we're done with the poly like key, yeah, then we can check out your pebbles if you want. Huh? No, I'm okay with mine checking them out. Those are those are really fun. That's the light, Ed. Animals. That way they've been on the whole time. That's okay. So you know, like on on land, terrestrial centipedes are kind of toxic, though they have a bit of a venom. Yeah. I wonder if there's anything here in the deep. Do any of these organisms that we've been looking at have any kind of similar kind of defense strategy? Of venom. Of like or venom like poison or any kind or of toxins. poison. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure there are. I haven't seen any specific species that come to mind so far that have like toxic traits. Well, but like, I'm sure it's a. I'm definitely sure it's an adaptation somewhere in the deep sea. Mm. I mean, coral and anemones have stinging tentacles, right? right yeah, they have the stinging right. nematocysts, but that's different from necessarily toxins. It's more of a physical irritant. A sudden reef. I'm seeing baboos, hemichoralliums, walteria. Have we done any eDNA e today? I don't think we have. It might actually be a good one might to take. Might be a good spot to do that, actually. Yeah. yeah. And then we should take one when we're back in the more sparse area for a background right. comparison. Also, really random time to come visit in Louisiana, but St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> Oh. One of my what favorite that holidays. Made? That's my little brother's birthday. I thought he was talking. It's not oh. bad. The St. Patrick's Day, we have parades and they throw food. <laughs> they throw <laughs> carrots, cabbage, basically any type of vegetable, throw it. Onions, instead of like beads and stuff. You just throw food. Oh. I heard Boston has a major St. Patrick's Day. Oh, I imagine. Yeah. yeah. But a lot of Irish there. Well, because we have a lot of Irish Catholics in Louisiana, in New Orleans. Mm. So. That's, that's my family. Yeah. Yeah, present. Don't, don't they dye the river green in Chicago? Or they, yeah. used, to, or they yeah. used to? I think they still do. Oh, do they? Yeah, no, I imagine. Non-toxic non green, I hope. The Boston. Full, full white. St. Patrick's Day is crazy. Like a, probably like a 24-hour party, yeah. just like it is in Let's go for a Niskin New Six, Orleans. please. Six. But on steroids. That's one holiday we always celebrated. We are about two meters off the bottom. Perfect, thank you. Tweet also, the when, when they have the parades, a lot of the Irish, my friend was an Irish dancer and she would perform and I was like so mesmerized by her Irish dancing. Oh, our daughter did that. Yeah, my sister used to do that. Like a long time ago, when she was a kid. Was it kind of like the um, the upper body is still and mostly yes. leg work? Yep. Yes. She had calves of steel. That's what we would nickname <laughs> her as. We were uh, working on this, these vans we're in right now at our partner facility, part of the Ocean Exploration Cooperative Institute at the University of Southern Mississippi in Gulfport. Uh, right when I Mardi Gras was coming up, and did, did you that trigger, trigger that? It looks like it in the back of that. Uh, I can't I see it, but let me uh, see if I can. Yeah, yeah number six is hard to monitor. tell. Yeah. Uh, the Where do we even port. see that? Oh, oh. I'm yep. Okay. The trigger? Yeah. All right, that's sure sample like zero seven two. Um. And uh, our colleagues from a similar NOAA vessel were over in Pascagoula, Mississippi. So we rang them up and met in Ocean Shores, which I think is Alabama, maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, had a great time. Yeah. As a matter of fact, in that wooden box over there, there's a baby from the king cake. <laughs> yeah, the wooden box. See I need right to up there? Oh, yeah. oh, okay. I was on a ship to shore with Elsa, and they were showing us a picture and were asking us if we had a shrine of. No shrine? I, I don't remember who it was of, but we were Wait. like, I have not seen that. 
We have a, an accidental shrine over there that I think has Mardi Gras beads, the king cake baby, and a picture of Billie Eilish. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, it was. They were asking about the Billie Eilish shrine. Wait, okay. yeah. what are you yeah. talking about? Over yeah, here on the left. Oh, weird. And Elsa and I were looking at the photo oh being like, God. I don't know. Weird. I've never seen that before. <laughs> and they were like, it's in the control van. It says, do not remove at all costs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And we won't get it, even get into the piece of wood that was on the old ROV frame, oh, yeah. which is still there. I went over and checked it out the other day. You want to start moving? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Also, king cakes are a big thing. Oh man, they're so good. You got randazzos, and also there's so much lore and drama surrounding all these king cake yep. makers. What is that? Is that a star? Sea star? That is a sea star. Would you like a closer look? Um, sure. Hey. What kind of cake is king cake? Like, what's the flavor? So you, there are multiple flavors, but the classic flavor mm -hmm. is cinnamon. A lot of people get cinnamon with cream cheese. There's also cinnamon yep. with strawberry, like filling. Oh. Um. Really, just like any anything. But there's this one. It's called Dong Fong King Cake, and it's at a an Asian restaurant, and they have like these thin layers of cinnamon dough, and it's go so zoom. good. Got it. So good. These are numbered for this bamboo coral. Ooh, I'm also looking at these red little corals here too. Yeah. That's a very cool picture, the before and after, the feeding. That uh, facility we were working at in Gulfport, Mississippi, at the University of Southern Mississippi, it was beautiful. Loved working there. What are those red? Uh, yeah. Corals? What are these little red corals? Zook. They look kind of like they could be anthomastis, but they look like they're kind of weirdly yeah. polyping There's small eight. areas. Yeah. Then we gotta zoom in our star. Which is a Gunniastrid star. It looks like it is hypisteria. I can see the hippo part. I think you said hippo. Hypisteria. All right, thank you. Those little red coral were interesting. Yeah, I'm curious what they were. Asako might think they're juvenile as uh, anthomasses for the mushroom corals. Is it common to find so many of them like that growing? Of the anthomastis? Yeah. Yes. We've seen them on nearly on every single dive yep. except the, um, oh, um, actually, any way we could go back to that? Oh, you want to go back? To the red polyps. Um, um, Asako uh, is asking for a collection. This. Well, there's, there's, sea there's, spider? there's a bunch of them. Oh, can we the zoom place? on that? Then we can go back uh, to the polyps, so we maybe. After. So there's polyps down there, too, as well? Those yeah. Red ones? They're, they're all over the place. Let's zoom on this guy first, if we can. Bridge, nav. All right, uh, go for zoom. Going in, holding. It looks like a sea spider. Um, is it though? That's the question. I'm seeing Coming a little. Out, maybe with a parasite. Oh. oh, there you go. Yeah, explain that. It doesn't <laughs> seem like, I don't think par um, sea spiders no, can move like that. No. It reads more like some kind of crab. Huh. Jake is on the hunt. Oh, oh. <laughs> Stubbed our tail. Cool. 
All right, now, what was the other thing you wanted to see? Um, those red polyps back I've there. I've seen several little pockets on them. So I don't know if you want to go back to the same exact ones or if you can go to a different pocket of them. Let me get low enough. Oh, there's some right there. Oh, there's some, I think. Yep. Let's just get a zoom quickly when we get a chance to double check. Oh, oop, don't land on it. <laughs> All right, go for funding. All right, let's get one more look and give Asako a chance to give her input before she decides if she wants to sample it. Because these do look like anthomastis a little bit. It's just weird that they're kind of weirdly separated polyps like this. Okay, Asaka, do you want to sample this still, or do we want to move on? The ship is stopped right now, by the way. The uh, ship is stopped right now. She's asking if we can try and collect this rock. Oop. The rock? The whole rock, or a slurp it? The, the rock, I believe. Uh, if it's a free rock. I think the other ones we saw were free rocks. How big is that? That's just what do you mean by free rocks? Like they're loose. Oh, we're not going to take the whole rock, though. That's what she's asking for. Really? Yeah. Uh, how many samples would that count as? It would count as one. It would just be a subsample of rock. So we need to check if it's loose? We well, can check if it's loose. Guys, hold on one second. Yeah, we get on a permit? Yeah, let's check the permit. Yeah, I, I'm just not sure that we can take a whole colony like that as part of it. We're supposed to just take a section or something. We've taken a whole colony of the stolen if before his last dive on a rock. Stand by. Um. Let me just go, let me go check with Daniel. Yeah. Take your time. Oh, there's um, a cup coral too. Prague, sorry, left out Prague. Prague was awesome too. It's a pretty small rock, so less than 10 centimeters. It's technically the second we've seen of it. Oh, there's more to the left right there too. Yeah, we've been seeing a few pockets. Yeah, so maybe the, if that one's not worked, there may be some lo more looser ones over there. A little push. Those look more promising. That way we're not taking a whole colony either. Does Steve only, is like not sure what they could be either, so stuff. it's more incentive for us to collect. What's the sampling objective, one specimen or multiple? Um, right now it seems like it's just a rock. I think they want multiple to ensure that they, they aren't stolen uh, fours, ferrets, uh, which are the ones that are connected uh, somehow. Hold on to my tight shot so uh, Daniel can see it down below. Yep. Keep the lasers in the frame. He might be sleeping. Uh, not anymore. <laughs> Steve says that if it's, a, it might, oh, Steve, Asako saying that we can also slurp it if we want. How um, attached are those? They seem pretty attached to me, which is why I'm leaning towards a collecting of the rock so, with Sometimes it. we have success scraping them off, but sometimes we don't. But if it's, a new, if it's a new species, is it worth the damage? 
Right, you get uh -huh. pieces of it if we slurp, yeah. I think. If you start scraping things off, it, they, they tend to break apart. Yeah, it's tame our black levels. What would you use bit. to scrape them off? The slurp. slurp. You would just, slurp. You just scrape it. the edge of the slurp. It's a metal uh, tube at the end. Yep, um, Mike's back. Let's see what the verdict is. Hello, everyone. Hello. So, yeah, we're okay. Um, Daniel said that it's a small rock. Um, it's uh, the only way you can really sample these is on the rock and rock and be able to scrape them off. And there's a, there's similar, or they're the same corals you know, in other places. So it's, you know, we've, we've seen them elsewhere, so we're, we're, we're okay to take just and there's, this rock. There's more to the left that look more on looser set of rocks. Um, so that might be a possibility as well. If we can't get this one. Oh, so we could get fewer individuals on a smaller rock. Yeah, on the left right there. Yeah, let's take a look at those. Especially since that one does look like it's pretty on there. It might be a difficult rock to collect. So it's worth taking a look at the smaller ones. I'm looking at those ones over there. I don't know if it looks I like they're on bigger rocks. So you think so? Yeah, yeah, it does. This one straight ahead looks like uh, it's probably not attached. And over here. Yeah, those all look there. like they're on bigger yeah, I don't know if any of those rocks are free. Okay, yeah. so do we only try for the one in front of us then? Yeah. All right. <coughs> full, full wide. Yeah, I mean, it's a small rock. We want uh, uh, port off bio on. Are oh, we yeah. going bio box? Um, how Starboard? big is it, the rock look to you guys? It's less than 10 centimeters. All right, let's go for one of the bio boxes then. All right, cameras. Push in a little bit. Yeah, coming in. Thanks. Holding there. All right. Well, it'll be easy enough to identify. I probably should just go right for the box, huh? <coughs> Where do you want to do a spin? Right in the box, I think. Yeah. Yep. You got a Williams grip there. Yeah. Where do you want it? Let's go for bio box A, if possible. Wow, that's a very... Uh, It's like how the queen holds a cracker. That's like <laughs> two big jaws, little rock. Very elegant. Yes. How do you guys remove the corals from the rocks? Um. We don't always. Okay. It depends on the situation. Most of the time, we just kind of carefully pick at the base okay. and see if we can get it free. Okay. I was just curious. I hadn't seen that part yet. I only see it when you hand me the rocks when it's done. Well, someone disappears before the process is done. Well, yeah. Usually, yeah, I, we're already done, and I'm like, sleep. Mm. Sorry, I forget which one you said. Um, A, preferably. Okay. Uh, while you're overdoing that, I'm gonna do some. I got you. Zoom in over here. Oh, there there's was. shrimp. There are like three shrimp. No, those two of them are the leftover polyps. Oh. So 
Sample collected in Alpha. Is that Alpha? Yeah. Yeah. Um, that is sample 73. 7-3. What are we calling those biological specimens? What's the question? What are we calling the organisms? Um, I'm calling them anthomastis-like polyps. Thank you. Ooh. Sebastian, how'd you do in spelling bees when you were a kid? <laughs> Not the best, really? honestly. You chose a field that... It's a little tough. Yeah. But luckily, there's something called inference. So long as I get about 90% of it, I'm good. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> as you can see, if you're looking at IPAC at all, there's a we are by waypoint four right now. I mean, we can count this as um, your rock as well, Hannah, if you want. Yeah, that's, that's cool with me. <laughs> it looks good. All right. So we're pretty much at waypoint four, which is nice. Um, Halfway there. What? Four out of eight. Oh, yeah. So we can continue moving on. Um, so Derek, it looks like you're doing like a stepped approach to waypoint five. Yeah, yeah there's that works. a little bit. I'm trying to stay up, up on this ridge more than yeah, down in this. Yeah, that makes sense. Trough. Waypoint four point five then. <laughs> exactly. I think unfortunately this whole dive is going to be too deep to see any sharks. No oh, sharks. Maybe on the recovery. Well, yeah, but maybe not, octopus though. Not the ones that I was looking for. Um, you. Did you see the white tips outside? I saw it from the surface. Yeah, it amazing. was amazing in here. Well, yeah, and I want to see the clip of that, but yeah. see, seeing a shark from the surface, not on the camera, is like so different. And Could just you please like, track a line just bearing three zero hovering eight. below the water. Can you figure out what the sharks were chasing at the surface? At they were chasing a school of silvery fish. A there were a couple large trevallis uh, large and a couple mahis. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it looked like Opello. I thought I saw a mahi. Too. I don't know what the um, English name is, but in Hawaii, <laughs> they're like really good eating fish. <laughs> Which yeah, one? they look tasty. They had like a very distinct kind of like. Well, the white tip sharks like know the sharks what they look tasty. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's, it's interesting because sharks actually don't swim the way in, in jaws, like with the fins above the water that often, like mm -hmm. they do, but it's not like a common, like way that they swim like a you know submarines have their periscope that's not really how sharks swim so like they're they're j just under the uh under the water um it's just like it's you can see you can see the white tips of their uh pectoral fins really cool i was able to watch them in here and then when i left the van i got to see one of them the yeah it was amazing and the highlights we got are really good Oh, good. I just like with the fish hanging out. Oh, that's awesome. I want to see those. We were scuba diving once at the uh, outer part of the bay down at Two Step Place of Refuge on Big Island. Saw a hammerhead. Oh, and yeah. uh, it was very remarkable how it seemed like its body was barely moving, you know, in that kind of side to side motion. Mm -hmm. But it was trucking through the water, it was moving. It was all yeah, muscle. they're fast and they're all, they're really strong, yeah. Especially those big ones. Also saw a tuna out there once, and that was like a bullet fired underwater. They're so fast. <laughs> That's a really great sight. Love that place. That is a beautiful dive. Where is it again? It's uh, south of Kona on Big Island oh, okay. uh, at a uh, place uh, called Dive uh, Two Step. I don't know what the uh, what's the name of that bay. Thank you, yes. Um, yeah, I haven't had a chance to dive in Hawaii yet. A really cool place uh, in Hawaiian culture, uh, 
I know it as place of refuge. And uh, I, here, let me get it wrong, and then I can have my expert correct oh, me. Is that a Tronicops? Is that a Tronicops? Where? Oh, yeah, those are Tronicops. <gasps> what? Here we go. Tronicops. Good eye. What's Tronicops? <laughs> no, there's nothing. It's uh, the it, sticker. It's a yeah. rockfish. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Oh, oh I thought gosh. that was a coral. Yeah. I've been, like, looking for this color yeah. <laughs> on all of our dives. And? Oh, oh it's cute. The patience has been rewarded. It's, uh, like, transparent. Mm-hmm. All right, go for zoom. They saw Thank a juvenile you. the other dive. It's black. Look at that. Oh. Aw. They're a cutie. I love you. <laughs> <laughs> I want to see its, like, mouth open. I like seeing that. I love you. <laughs> <laughs> That was awesome. Look at the baby fins. Yeah. Baby feet. Do we think this is like a juvenile or is it like It's an normal? adult. Yeah, uh, juveniles are black. Oh, it's just normally this yeah. tiny and cute? I mean, and it's I get female, the right? Aren't the large in. ones female? There's lasers. I think oh. I've heard that. Oh, yeah, in the palm of your hand. It's small, yeah. It might be a male then, if that's the case. Like the apparently all the the bigger ones are all females because the males don't get very big. That's actually quite common uh, in uh, fish, I think. That, like sharks, the bigger ones are are, are the females. Oh. oh, are they about to make a move, or oh. are they just come all the way out and do a slow push in if you don't mind? Oh yeah. Oh, I'm so happy. I love showing Tronicops videos. Does it have a common name? Um, like rockfish or it's something? Kind of like something? A, it's kind of like adjacent re related to an anglerfish. Oh, okay. Tron Tronicops. Well. Tronicops. Tronicops. So I think What's right in front of the eye there? Oh, yeah. Tronicops. Yeah. That I could be a lure just hanging out. I don't know. Oh. I can't tell unless we look from the front if there's another one on the other side. So and this, this is about like the size of a fist or sea toad. Yeah, I've never heard called that before, though. But I can, nice I spot, can see Jake. that. And this is like Look our unofficial face. mascot, right? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> we have a sticker. <laughs> oh, that's a, my mug. Yeah. That makes it official, then. Oh. <laughs> uh, it's adorable. Can I get Tori a view of the face? Please. Oh, oh. Don't run. Even though I'm pretty sure you don't run, you probably like wobble. Yeah. <laughs> I wish he would hitch a ride on us. <laughs> <laughs> Pull one of those galatheos from last dive. Oh, that's a that's a coral. That's a sponge. That crab was so cute, just like standing there, standing guard on our porch. What is on this sponge? It's all the yellow. We're moving right now at 0 0.2 for the ship, so just let me know if you want to change speed. What's going on here? It allows us to decide. Can we get a zoom in and whatever is growing on it? Yeah, yeah, zoom right in. Yep. Here you go. Oh, it's a coral. Oh. Huh. Is the sponge growing on the coral, or is the coral growing on the sponge? Man, too early. Can we get a look on the other side, possibly? Yeah, let me, uh, Can you tell by the base? Pirouette. Um, the base leans coral, but just want to be sure. Because it could just be dead sponge base. Oh, wow. Yeah, I'm leaning that the sponge is growing on the coral. I've never seen anything like this before, though. Mm, yeah, this looks weird. Looks like a Tim Burton sponge. Growing. Can we get an ID on the coral? Let's see. Uh, really see how the sponge diffuses the light when the lasers yeah. hit it. Yeah, go for zoom. Yep, yep gone in and in. Whoa. Uh, these are all too dead to make a good ID. I haven't seen any polyps. Oh, there's a gal head right there. Well, lobster. Interesting. Are we going back? Can we fish? see the base? No, mm. guess not. Coming out. I'm just trying to see if it's a bamboo or not. <laughs> but that's a sponge, isn't it? Well, a sponge uh, on a coral. Sponge oh, I thought it was a coral on the sponge. No, it's a sponge on the coral. Oh. 
You can tell because the white fades before the base. If we zoom on the base, gone on the base. Uh, it's not too definitive here. Might be a black coral based on those, but the rest of them don't look black. So it, it, does it look like sponges. the coral might be dead? The coral is definitely dead. dead. And then the sponge is just on it's top just, Yeah, I'm not sure space. if the sponge, you know, engulfed it and killed it, or if it, the, the coral was already dead. I'm leaning towards the coral is already dead because it's standing up. If it was, had died already, it would have fallen over. But this sponge is possibly keeping it intact. Great. Yeah. Cool stuff. Yeah. All right. So, uh, get back to place of refuge, and Malia can correct me. In uh, Hawaiian culture, uh, there were certain taboos that were not to be broken. And if one were to break a taboo, there would be severe punishment. But if you could escape and get to the place of refuge, you would be safe. Uh, and it is adorned these days with uh, really cool artifacts and carvings and such. How much of that is correct? Yeah, so the, the um, place I think you're referring to is Honau Nau, over on the um, Kona side of Hawaii yeah. Island. So usually every island had these pu'u honua, or places of refuge, sometimes more than one or two. But um, yes, you if you were able to get to that area safely, then you were cared for. Um, you had a time to be with the kahuna, or who were the um, kind of spiritual um, leaders of that space. And um, the kapu system was really a, a system of um, land and people organization um, that was based on really understanding your environment so that you don't um, harm it. So when I think about the kapu system, you know, there were certain species of fish that you didn't fish at certain times. You know, it was all about like, how do you care for a place thinking in the long term so that all of your natural resources um, will be available for the next generations. So, you know, there were strict expectations regarding people's behaviors. So, yeah, Pu'uhonua, very cool places um, that people could get um, protection. And then eventually they would be able to leave and go back to their, um, to their homes. This is an ET sponge, yeah? It looks like an ET sponge. Oh if we back gosh. up, it should be an ET sponge. Wow. I've been waiting for one of these, too. Tori, they're just hitting everything on your bucket list. <laughs> we got chocolate cups, we got ET sponge. Oh, you're just manifesting this morning. I know, I have on my <laughs> hammerhead shark earrings. I know we were discussing them earlier, but yeah. they brought Oh, maybe we'll see wow. one of them next. I think we're too deep. We'll take any shark, but I'm Chanakov's and ET sponge. Wow. Steve is agreeing that it's likely an ET sponge. Adavana Magnifica. ET Magnifica. Okay. Asako agrees. Nice. All right, Tori, what else is on your list? I'll be honest, those were the two things that I was like, <laughs> I have to see. So, like, I don't, now I need to you add You got to come up, so, yeah, you got to yeah, add yeah. some more. You got to mm. spice up this watch. As uh, the great Greek philosopher Oprah would say, you need new <laughs> dreams now. I feel like we've seen, I got my, like, fill with Dumbo octopus. I don't know, yeah. that one dive. Um, what else? We can manifest some sharks for Mike. Yeah, I would like some sharks. I feel like the other watches we've seen, I don't know how many fossilized whale bones. So like far, two so far. so far. So instead of bones, how about an actual whale? Ooh. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, was, I said that la yesterday because it was so beautiful at sunset. I was like just imagining if a whale like oh, yeah. just like I've came out of the ocean. I don't I only know of one time that an ROV has seen a whale. 
That's ROV Herc. And that was, yeah, it was uh, Hercules in the Gulf of Mexico. Yeah. Um, and boy, did news of that spread fast. Yeah, but it's also an incredible video. Uh, I, I don't think I realized that was like the only time, because I use that Spermo video time, every yeah. interaction. Um, I love it. I've always wondered who was piloting during that. Do you know that? Uh, I think it might have been Greg. Uh, Diffendale, but I'm not sure. Uh, I was on another vessel with another ROV, and w we heard about that probably within an hour of it happening, <laughs> and we were in a completely different part of the world. It was like the uh, first expedition of that year, and I, I was on the next one, and I, that, that's all all we heard about. <laughs> well, and the funny thing is to hear this story from the people who were on the watch that was not there. Oh, like yeah. You come up from... It's like, oh yeah, they just got footage of a whale, and you're like, what? <laughs> yeah. You're sleeping. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, is there any kind Eat of like dinner. sonar yeah. that's being emitted, like right now, mm -hmm. with what we're doing? Yeah. So the scanning sonar on the right, um, which is how we were looking at the uh, the aircraft carriers as well. When we were, for our viewers, we were streaming that on channel three. That's going at all times. It's a sector scan, so it goes out in uh, horizontal bands. Um, but it's it's not at a frequency that w I mean whales will hear it, but it's not mm -hmm. gonna very high frequency. I wonder if it just deters. It probably deters. It could. Yeah, I mean Hercules is a loud vehicle anyway. Like you can hear like a whine it, when it powers on and it has thrusters and I mean it's it's making a lot of noise in addition to the light. Um, so yeah, whales are very very aware that mm -hmm. it's here. On so top, they, they might yeah. be avoiding it. On top of the sector scanning sonar, we also have a USBL. Oh, that yeah. pings to the ship. Yeah. The ship also pings back to it. We also have a DVO which shoots four beams down, and an altimeter on Atalanta that also pings downwards towards the seafloor. So there's but a lot of sonars going off in different directions. Yeah. All of those things would have also been on when they had the encounter with the whale. Yeah, I think he was yeah. coming over to check it out because he was curious. Yeah. And it was a juvenile. But yeah, they are, oh. Malia, they are very aware that we're here. <laughs> so, I mean, it's important to keep in mind that each all creatures that can hear have a different hearing sensitivity range, so they can hear different frequencies of sound, or can't hear different frequencies. Mm -hmm. So, like, humans have a frequency range, and if sounds are below or above that, we won't know, we won't be aware that there's sound emitted. Mm -hmm. So, um, like, the USBL is at a, a quite low frequency, so it can travel far in water without getting attenuated, and then like our, our uh, forward-looking sonar on the ROVs uh, and the downward-looking DVL sonar to track the bottom. Those are much higher frequencies. Um, they attenuate faster. And yeah, so they don't go very far, in other words. <laughs> um, and if you can't hear in that frequency range, you, you wouldn't hear them. Um, so it's, it's always interesting to think about sound in the ocean and uh, you know, what our sort of sound footprint is as we move around, even with a scientific vessel or cognizant of wanting not to harm anything. Um, and so a lot of it's about the, the exact frequency, the powerful, how much sound is emitted initially can determine how far it travels through the water, how directional the sonar is. So um, something like a multi-beam is very directional. I don't know if you've looked in the lab, it's basically like a fan a downward pointed fan. So it's very narrow along the, the direction the ship's moving, uh, but it looks out very far on either side of the ship. That's a really good point, Thanks Stark. Stark, is it uh, multi-beam 30 kilohertz? Uh, yeah, it's, yeah, that's its kind of nominal frequency, which right. means like centered around that, basically. It does have some variation on different portions of the swath or slightly different frequencies. Um, so like the outer beams, are actually slightly lower than uh, that. No uh, kidding. They're like 28 and a half um, to try to get out some, some, try to get additional range where well, those beams are shooting much farther distances than the ones right under the yeah. ship. The other thing you can think about is it's like the loudest marine mammals, sperm whales, emit sound at about, or over 200 decibels, some of their clicks, and most of our sonars don't reach that level of, of strength. Yeah, I think so the source level on the multi beam is about 220 if I recall. Yeah, right. that's about the same level. But that's, that's right beneath the ship. Um, so it, it's definitely not that at some distance away. So and I know there's protocols if we observe marine mammals on the surface to secure. Yeah. And 
Yeah, we, we want to not startle anything, so we actually, well, first of all, when we ever, we start the multi-beam, for instance, we, we have a slow ramp up procedure, so we're basically pinging quietly um, at a low, low source level, and then we gradually uh, move it up to the, the source level we use for mapping, um, so that if something can hear it and is bothered by it, we're trying to basically say, hey, we're over here, if you don't like this, you can move away. Um, yeah, I think the um, on the surface, it's more the vessel needs to be aware and not run over anything. Yeah, certainly the if we see anything on the surface, we're trying to not get in its way. Yeah. And move away. Yeah. And boy, right along the continental shelf off the west coast of North America, it's whale central, and uh, you see no shortage of. We've been on station before, and been surrounded by whales. Yeah, somewhat some. A lot of times, often to like different species have different curiosity. I guess you could say that. Pilot whales are known to come and kind of investigate ships, even when their active sonars are on, like like scientific ships. Um, and dolphins, I've seen come and bow ride um, yeah. vessels like ours pretty frequently if they're in the area. So, uh, I think that's there's a mix of curiosity there, and then the the bow riding I think is more of a playful behavior. It's, it's pretty fun to watch. You can peek over the bow and watch them riding the wake of the ship. I always joke that they just come by vessels and do that because they want a sacrifice of sunglasses because somebody <laughs> invariably looks down from the bow and loses their sunglasses. Got to, got to wear your keepers. Um, it's almost like hitching a ride too when they're on the bow. Like Yeah, because they're being efficient. pushed forward yeah. by, the, uh, by yeah. the vessel pushing the water. It is really cool though because it makes you realize what incredible swimmers they are because oh, they're, they're keeping pace with the ship easily like it looks like they're barely trying and they're just cruising along and they're yeah. just such a beautifully uh, streamlined animal. Well, I got some footage on a vessel that Derek and I worked on uh, we were in the Gulf of Mexico and one of the dolphins uh, turned inverted in front of the boat and was slapping its tail on the <laughs> water as it was getting pushed along so cool uh, and we were uh, off of Santa Barbara, California once and saw a blue whale. Wow, that's big. Yeah. Yeah, it's Biggest definitely not our... whale season in Papahanaumokuakeo. So oh. I wonder what other um, types of whales may frequent these waters. There's an urchin over on the right. I haven't seen a lot of those. Several, but not a lot. Derek, I'm looking at pictures of pilot whales now. I've never heard of them before, and I love them. Yeah, they're, they're really neat. They're very social. Um, yeah, we had probably 150 to 200 of them, uh, just like in a, a herd around the ship when we were um, on site with the ROVs uh, deployed off of Spain in 2011. Wow. Yeah, they and, live and in, they like, were just super there. pods. Yeah, it was like a super pod, just, and they were just hanging out for days. Just, I think they just, because we would, like, look over and, like, obviously point and squeal and that sort of stuff. Um, and I think they just like being interacted with. They're really chill. Yeah. You would see those giant pods of uh, belugas when I lived in Alaska. Ooh. They would come in the cook inlet on the boar tide. Yeah, belugas are neat because they could actually kind of swivel their head. <laughs> yeah. What? Yeah. yeah, they kind of look over at, at you. Uh, they also have this like bulbous shape on their head. That, like. Looks well, like a giant brain. It, it like adjusts its shape depending on how they're trying to communicate. Oh, really? And it changes like the frequency or the tone or something. In the huh. yeah, yeah, that's cool. I I learned that at Mystic Aquarium where they have a beluga whale. Yeah. Beluga whales. And I that was my favorite place growing up. Going there. And would yeah, I, I would go. I would go Mystic. There Mystic. The whales are very. They're very playful. They'll spit water at you. They'll come yeah. up and say hi. They'll scare you. They'll actually. If a kid is standing near the edge of the aquarium, they'll they'll appear out of nowhere and like scare them and then the kid will like run away so on like, purpose you can almost see the whale laughing it's, yeah it's, they're so cute uh, yeah well speaking of like uh acoustics and marine mammals and mimicking nature and things like that like i think the a lot of marine mammals have really perfected using acoustics to understand their surroundings um, it's basically like a it's like i think for them it's like sight like um but we don't really have a sense I guess that's the most analogous sense we have 
to understanding our surroundings. Yeah. Uh, but it's pretty amazing. So um, dolphins, they can they can kind of modify their their frequency, their their clicks, and their um, calls, and it sort of sweeps through a different like a range of frequencies, and that gives them a lot of information back at uh, kind of a higher signal to noise ratio in acoustics. Um, and that's, we sort of mimic that with some of the man-made sonars where we're, instead of just chirping at a, a single frequency, we're actually sweeping through uh, a certain range of frequencies. Uh, it's called a chirp signal, and it's uh, actually used in our sub-bottom. Um, and it, it's a way to sort of boost your signal to noise because you're looking for that signal to match, the return signal to match what you sent out. Um, and it helps you understand the signal you sent, what you received. So nature's already figured out how to do that uh, very effectively. And there's a lot more protocols in managed areas now to uh, mitigate impacts or reduce impacts on marine mammals. So for instance, when Nautilus a month or two ago was transiting through the Strait of Juan de Fuca between Canada and Washington State, we have to travel at reduced speeds and uh, secure uh, things that make noise. Uh, in that confined area. Yeah. There's a lot of research going on now too just to understand like sort of the soundscapes of different parts of the ocean. They'll actually put out just passive, passive listening hydrophones um, either on a mooring on the seafloor or sometimes they do like a string up into the water column and listen um, just to, it's a great way to uh, listen for what's in the area and try to understand. Like you can actually understand like what species of marine mammals are moving through an area just by listening and recording that and then matching it to what we know are their calls. And the uh, Cable Ocean Observatories, uh, both American and Canadian, have uh, hydrophones as part of their array that send data live. Uh, it gets scrubbed before it's available, but uh, reviewed. Uh, but lets them build a uh, very, very long time series data. Yeah. So we have actually been on the, when, when I was on the Okeanos Explorer, we had a partnership um, we did with Marine Fisheries Service Office in NOAA, and it was basically deploying one of these long term monitoring sound. Um, buoys, or sorry, moorings that would listen um, for, for marine mammals. So that was pretty neat. Drop the mooring and it's kind of a string of listening hydrophones and batteries and you know where you dropped it and then you come back many months later and download all that information. Yeah, that was one of the um, projects when I first went into Papahanaumokuakea was a Sank Sound <clears throat> project. So we were dropping acoustic receivers, um, picking some up that were uh, in kind of shallower waters. But really it was for understanding whales and their presence in Papahanaumokuakea. So very cool, you know, that we can use um, different tools to kind of assess populations. Now those uh, hydrophones, do they have to go to the Navy first before you get access to the data? Uh, not that I know of. I know huh. the Navy was part okay. of the, the Sank Sounds, um, you know, one of the, the funders for that, but I'm not sure regarding that yeah, the, portion. Um, yeah. The acoustic sound that each submarine makes is different, so they have an acoustic signature, if you will, so it's very closely protected. So most hydrophones in. Uh, U.S. waters get uh, the Navy does a first pass uh, to take out any of their anything that might have recorded something going by. Yeah, that makes sense if they were one of the project sponsors. Mm -hmm. But yeah, there's a lot of places where the organisms in an area make sound. You know, that's there's a whole natural soundscape to a lot of places, especially in like uh, coral reefs, like shallow water. 
Oh yeah, the clicking of the shrimp or yeah, you can hear the lobsters on the east coast. Even the human hearing can pick up a lot of those. Uh, yeah. You can often hear like parrotfish uh, yep, eating chewing. Oh. Yeah, if you go to Shrinking. Hanama Bay here in Hawaii, you can often hear the parrotfish chewing on the coral skeletons. It's certainly a sound. Yeah. Thanks, Derek. I was literally about to ask you, like, what else or what other organisms we can hear besides, like, whales and dolphins. I didn't know that about parrotfish. Yeah, shrimp uh, up and make a lot of noise. <laughs> a lot of noise. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Pretty much what you hear, the crackling, yeah. you know, when oh. you start to go down. <laughs> uh, yeah, we can. We definitely hear, like, dolphin calls if you're oh, snorkeling yeah. or diving somewhere with dolphins nearby. It's a really cool sound. Uh, there's uh, many other species, I don't know. Uh, Seals, they, they bark, make grunting noises underwater. So I was just looking up what some of the um, cetaceans that visit Papahanaumokuakea um, includes um, false killer whales, bride's whales, um, and beaked whales. One of the Besides the kohola, the humpback. Interesting thing about whales and whale identification is a lot of that can be done by the shape of their exhale spout. Uh, I actually have a whale ID guide that you use the shape of the spout to tell what type of whale you're looking at. So that's the, the sort of cloud the spray, of yeah. when they breathe yeah. at the surface. Yeah. Uh, hold on, I have it over here. I believe the bones we've been seeing that have been like covered in manganese crust have been mostly beaked whale bones so far. And they're very common out here in the monument comparatively to a lot of other whales because they're deep sea going whales. They primarily feed on the seafloor and spend significant times down under the water, barely coming up for breath. But they're also a very shy and elusive species so we don't rarely see them. We often see them more as carcasses that wash up on shore here in Hawaii. Um, and you also see evidence of them in more sedimented areas where they sc scrape the floor for invertebrates. Wow, yeah, I realized I had never like looked up a picture of what they looked like. I had just like seen the pictures of the fossilized bones. So it's interesting to hear that we can find fossilized bones um, I know some, aren't there some organisms that actually feed on the bones um, themselves? Yes, there yeah. is uh, whale falls. Also, there's a, some kind of purple object on the right. Sorry. Um, oh, Holothorian. Okay, it's Holothorian. Okay. Um, but yes, there are, um, for whale falls, there's also dolphin falls. Um, there's like organisms that go through several different phases as the body decomposes and gets eaten in them. And there are certain animals, such as os Osidax worms, that will actually burrow into the bones of these whales and like reduce them down for their basic proteins. There's a researcher, Dr. Fabio DeLeo, at uh, University of Victoria Ocean Networks Canada, who has done work putting whale bones down and then studying the growth and uh, organisms that collect and feed on them. A snail, or just snail? The white thing straight ahead, or is it just a clothes? It looks like a shell or a sponge. Yeah. I was thinking yeah. a sponge. I'm leaning sponge, but may as well take a closer look. Hearing a lot of sponge. No wagering. <laughs> Going in. Go in. Yep. I'm thinking that's a sponge. Yep. Yes. Yeah, it's a very round one. On a is hot it growing? Rock. <laughs> oh, I haven't been practicing with the flows today. Watch it grow. Yeah, we're just gonna stay here and watch it grow. All right, sounds good. Stick on. Yeah. See you in <laughs> 12 years. <laughs> Hi. 
Hannah, can you say that again? What would you call these rocks? Oh, those were botryoidal. Botryoidal. Which is like grape like looking. Botryoidal. You said it's what looking? Grape like. Grape. Grape like, okay. I thought Bachelor is a little bit more angular. Hmm. You gotta love science jargon. <laughs> couldn't couldn't say bumpy. No. <laughs> they couldn't just say grape like either. <laughs> they had to think of a hard term. To call I think some of us Oh wait, I I see it. Oh, a chalk hops. Yep. And get a head on shot this time. Mm -hmm. Yay. Okay, Ooh, we haven't lucky practiced are we? It so far today, but Kukai and Naha. Yeah. Kukai and Naha. Naha. Oh, Sebastian, what is a diet for the Chana Cops? Um, they are ambush predators, I believe. So I think they just wait for small invertebrates and small fish to swim by, and then they just surprise and attack them and eat them. So this guy is so cute, I can never imagine oh, any it's one. antagonism. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, to... Uh, Oh, this is a good one. Let's go all the way in. Say yeah. hello. <laughs> Time for your close up. Hi. It looks so amused. <laughs> it looks like it has a Voldemort nose. So I think that <laughs> thing I was oh. seeing above the eye is actually there in the front, of which on a human you would say a nose, but above the mouth, there's one, they're bilateral. Mm -hmm. Do you yeah. see what I'm talking about? Yeah. And looks do like you want to do a bump, a tilt up? for me, Jake, instead of me. There you go, thank there you. Go. And I'll get the lasers in here in a second. It looks like there might be a Are small lure in that central area right there. The little pink thing. Yeah, oh. I see it. Right along, the, uh, like the center line, the spine. The yeah, blue. like right in the nose area. Just full zoom, yeah. This reminds me of my, our dog. She's an English <laughs> bulldog. Look at her face. Get the lasers. Yeah, I see the their same. <laughs> There's lasers. Lasers. Smash face. It's an <laughs> ugly but cute effect. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Only a face a mother could love. This is also a botryoidal. All right, let me uh, stay here. I'm just going to come out and do a slow push in. Rudder. How big can they get? Like, is this a juvenile or is this a uh, This is an adult, I believe. Wow. I don't think they get much bigger than this. So they probably have two seeds, either just sitting here or striking extremely quickly when there's some food nearby. Yes. Very much ambush predators. Okay. Great, thank you. Bye, John the Cops. Bye. Good night, Jake. We love you. Mm -hmm. I got a John the Cops eye. Yeah, yeah, you do. I heard you say it, you and I started looking. At. Couldn't see where it was. Nice. I think that's three total for this dive so far. I heard the last watch saw one too. Oh wow. We've been seeing things in threes, the uh, Dumbos the other day. Mm -hmm. And a viewer earlier suggested that I added um, a gulper eel to my list. Ooh, yes. Oh, yeah. Which I do show that video also very frequently. That was shot time. by video engineering intern Sarah Metasic wow. on her first or second watch. Wow. I love what that video. That a gulper the gulper eel. eel. Oh, oh, yeah. I love that one. Has anyone ever seen the documentary Biggest Little Farm? No. 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 Man, so good. People buy a farm in California and work to bring it into balance. Uh, and uh, Sarah uh, left Nautilus and took a job there as their in-house cinematographer. And is just finishing up a three-year contract. That's cool. Try 
to get her back out here next season once she's available again. Would you come back like as a contract employee? Yeah, yep. Uh, a lot of our video engineering interns do come back. Uh, a lot of them, uh, really, this is what they do. Uh, I have a large cohort of contractors who usually have master's degree in wildlife cinematography. Uh, and then they're out shooting for National Geographic and the BBC when they're not out here with us. Wow. So um, I think Erin Rainey, one of our well-known contractors, uh, is headed up to Alaska to shoot grizzlies again. She just released a, a film. Video. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that that's kind of about her. Yeah. Uh, and uh, was fortunate enough to be able to. Uh, she lives not far from us. I just saw her recently, and thank goodness because I was able to re re uh, return the pie tin that Antonella left at her house, <laughs> having cook something at Aaron's place before they came up. We have a lot of Nautilus folks who swing by our house. I also like to connect with shipmates on my travels. That's kind of fun. So I went up to St. John's, Newfoundland and Montreal with a shipmate once. And Kim and I were in Drogheda, Ireland, connected with uh, one of the captains of the Nautilus, Captain Neil. Kind of fun. You end up with uh, colleagues from all over the world doing this work. Mm -hmm. My brother's in Abu Dhabi. I'm hoping to get over and see him. And uh, we have a uh, shipmate, Captain Suleiman Al Somani, who's a captain in the Royal Sultanate Navy in Oman. Uh, love to get down soon. That's pretty close there. Although, boy, oh boy, is it hot over there. It's like. Some days it gets up to in the 50s, uh, which is like, I think, 121 Fahrenheit. Speaking um, of which, what's our water temperature? Water temperature? Yeah. Probably 4 degrees C. Let's see. Oh, 2 degrees C. 2. So we have a viewer that just sent in like the sweetest message and dropped a link. Um, and they said that Nautilus Dives inspired them to create this Chonicops. And the link they just sent is an Etsy link to a hand crocheted Chonicops. And it is so cute. Oh boy. So um, yeah, there's lots of crocheted uh, deep sea animals. Uh, our former SCF, uh, Jenny or Woodman. No, I can't remember her last name. She's crocheted a ton of stuff. She just took a job with Schmidt. Bridge nap. Uh, yeah. That. Can we please track a lion bearing 285 at 0 0.2 knots? Yes, if any of y'all want that hand crocheted Tronicops, looks like there's only six left. So there you go. Go to Etsy. Um, and go grab them. Great way to take a, a super adorable deep sea animal and make it even cuter. Yeah. Some red there on the left. Red on or the left. I don't know what that is. Red. Just down. It's not red. Dark. Under the lasers now. Oh, uh, side of a rock. Never mind. We've seen sides of rocks. <laughs> so it's so cool that some of our viewers are getting so creative and being inspired. Yeah, by these dives and creating some cool stuff. We have viewers from all over the world. We have a frequent viewer from New Zealand um, who's indigenous. Uh, it's a Maori. Maori? Uh, Maori. Uh -huh. um, and I mentioned that I was headed to Auckland with a shipmate once and she said you really should go to this museum and check out this exhibit and we actually did uh, so it was really great to have that connection to our oh, viewers this one just didn't have a no I picked a here. 
picked a poor rock. Yeah, I know they, I've heard they have a beautiful museum. Oh, it's um, unbelievable. In, um, Aotearoa, yes. I think Daniel, he went to a museum and he was sending us some pictures. It yeah, awesome, right? just those so cool. Should we help it out, tip it over? Yeah, kind of. Uh, maybe what that's what caused it to fall over. I think the museum is uh, in Aotearoa, New Zealand, is Te Papa Tonga Reva. Te Papa Tonga Reva Museum of New Zealand. Hannah, where is somewhere on your bucket list to travel and see some geology? I know you've got some places. Um, like y'all said earlier, Iceland. Yeah. Because just so many things in Iceland. Is yeah. Easy. Do you scuba dive at all, Hannah? Sorry, what did you say? Do you scuba dive? No. Uh, there's a place in Iceland where you can scuba dive and touch the North American plate or the Pacific, is it the Atlantic plate? North American it's and North which? North American and Euro Eurasian. Eurasian. You can touch both plates at the same time. You're in the divide between the two. That's insane and makes me want to go there even more than I already yeah. want to go there. <laughs> you yeah, can the snorkel Atlantic there. Ridge runs right into Iceland. Thank you. But definitely... Um, so it's separated? Iceland and then That's Norway the and Sweden. The tectonic plates are pushing apart. Yeah, also okay. on my list. Yeah. And then... I want to go see Mount Etna just because I have, because mm -hmm. I did a project on it. So we, I have we a, s it has a place in my heart. We sailed by it a couple times uh, when we went from, I was on board from Turkey to over to Spain and back, wow. and you can see you can see it glowing, the top yeah, of it I from the, from so the water. Bad. Yeah, those those are just some of the places, but yeah. really just like anywhere. <laughs> I know, like, um, when my students are learning about plate tectonics, they have one assignment where it, like, takes them to all these different places on Google Earth so they can, like, see the landforms and features that we've been talking about. Mm -hmm. and there's, like, I think a national park in Iceland that's, like, a rift valley, and, like, I love just having them kind of, like, drop in there and, like, look around and walk around. I would yeah. love to go visit. Yeah, I think it's called Thing Thingvellir. Or yeah. Um, yeah, we, I did that as a family trip. A really? Years. We drove the whole ring road and visit a lot of the national parks. It was spectacular. Uh, it's such a great place to visit. Wow. And uh, don't they have the best restaurant in the world? Well, I, they do have good, that, I know the restaurant you're speaking of, but they also have the world's best hot dog stand. Oh, that's two uh, different extremes. Yes. Uh, <laughs> in Iceland? Yeah. The world's best cup of coffee. It, the hot dogs are, we actually left dinner at that restaurant and then still had a hot dog before we went back to our hotel. Mm -hmm. We couldn't pass it up. They're so good. Uh, Icelandic people are awesome. The art, the architecture, but the nature there, just driving around. There's a million waterfalls. There's like waterfalls uh, around every corner. Yeah. It's insane. And virtually the entire country is powered by geothermal. Yeah. Yeah. One of my like favorite TV shows to watch or that I got into was Amazing Race. Oh, it's so good. It's the best oh show on gosh. television. I love Amazing Race. Yeah. The is drama it is similar so to like Survivor? No. No, N no it's it's uh, it, well, it's a travel show where you have to uh, do tasks in different places and oh. they move at a breakneck speed, but it's uh, it's so cool. like it's, you just see uh, so many different You embrace culture yeah. and uh, yeah, it's way more wholesome. I think it's couples usually or teams mm -hmm. too. They did a family one. I watched that. I watched all the ones like from the early 2000s when it was like just starting. And it was actually kind of weird because there was one before 9-11 and it was still there, like the Twin Towers. Oh, yeah. And I was, I was like, whoa, this is, this is crazy, like watching it. And, um, but yeah, Amazing Race, Really, watching that show has showed me like a lot of like cool places that I would never have thought to go. Like, 
I would never probably want to go to Russia, but their museums there are insane. And and like St. Petersburg and Moscow, just from looking w watching Amazing Race. They've won the Emmy for uh, best uh, unscripted reality show like eight years in a row. It's uh, yeah, it's amazing. Wow. All right. I so. used to love watching Anthony Bourdain. Oh, yeah. Like his, like uh, amazing, like not just the food, but he would connect with the local people. Yeah. yeah. Oh, he was amazing. Mm -hmm. Have you guys seen the Stanley Tucci Italy uh, show? My wife's no, watching it right now. It. Yeah. Awesome. It's so good. Because he does the same thing. He like connects to, to people in Italy and, and oh, his, no. his, his lineage is Italian. Uh, and it's so cool. He, he does different... Um, Areas there's like 23 area like I don't know that regions regions are uh, something of Italy and he does I mean he's on season two but he's doing what like an episode of each one and some of the the food dishes that they talk about and they talk about the history of the food and all that it's so cool that's almost kind of cheating for somebody from you know with an Italian heritage to get somebody to pay for you to do that as a job You're like someone telling me they wanted to send me the you know. Irish pubs all over Ireland for two years and pay me to do it. Didn't well, I, I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff that he's, um, <laughs> you know, he's going to like these like side shops and, and alleyways that are, you know, like that have been there for centuries. You know, it's 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 not it's a lot of places that and yeah. a lot of foods that you don't actually know about. Um, you know, because he's looking at the actual origins of some of the food. It's not like. Right. You know, the obvious stuff that we think about when we go to Italy. I feel like I would enjoy that because I watched somebody feed Phil. And that was oh, also, that's a great one, too. That was so good. That's somebody else who embraces the locals and the local yeah. culture. It's done by the executive producer of the uh, Everybody Loves Raymond show. Yeah, it's really it's really cute because he also ends like almost every like episode with him FaceTiming his parents and like talking to them and it, it yeah. was just so cute. Yeah, well, as you get deeper into the show, uh, you know, they're elderly. Yeah. Something I've been listening to that has kind of been similar for me where it's just like exposed me a bunch of new places and Hannah, I know we've talked about it before, yeah. but there's a podcast called National Parks After Dark and like I never listened to any podcast ever and like <laughs> this one kind of hooked me because the first one I listened to was about um, the eruption of Mount Rainier and I just like kept listening because they were talking about a man named Harry Truman and like halfway through it I was sitting uh, there being like what is that's is this not and Rainier that is uh, St. Helens St. Helens thank you Mount St. Helens and I listened to that entire episode and then was like obsessed and yeah he didn't leave yeah and that episode like what i enjoy about the podcast is like they teach you a lot about the park itself the history of that area the people that live there they spend the time like a lot of time also just recognizing like the indigenous people there and talking about just kind of how the park came to be um and then it's called national parks after dark because they kind of will choose some stories and a lot of times they're like uh, maybe accidents or like mysteries or something that happened and I've learned about so many different national parks that I did not know existed like not just in the United States but very interesting stories. And our national parks and our protected areas are such an amazing resource and part of mm -hmm. here including the monument here and uh, the rest of our marine sanctuaries. Nautilus yes. has spent a great deal of work assisting NOAA in understanding those areas to help manage them. And, uh, and that's a big job. Mm -hmm. It's a huge job to manage such, you know, I mean, when you think about Papahanaumokuakea at 582,000 square miles of mostly ocean, and then 10 emergent islands like and it's a very unique management system so we have four different entities that manage um this largest marine protected area in the u.s so how many, how large 500 some square miles 582,000. so slightly smaller than alaska 
Yeah, so larger than all the national parks in the U.S. put together. I think I saw the fun fact on the board yesterday, double the size of Texas. Mm. And then there was another one written that I didn't have a chance to read before it got Larger erased. than the Gulf of Mexico. 379 Rhode Islands. 379. <laughs> it's 365. It's 379? Give or take. Yeah, what's a Rhode Islander, too? That's exactly. <laughs> But so important, you know, I'm especially grateful to, for being out here because this kind of expeditions help me to tell the story of this place. Um, you know, and it, having this experience is just gonna help me to bring the place to the people since it's, you know, inaccessible to mostly everybody in the world. Um, having these stories and these experiences is key to getting people to, you know, connect with Papahana mm -hmm. It's really interesting for, uh, you know, some of our shipmates have come up to the, the first and second islands uh, past the, uh, in, uh, into the monument on the south in traditional canoes. Uh, using celestial navigation to do that. And they've also come all the way up here with this vessel using very advanced modern technology. So they're able to have that traditional cultural experience and be connected to the rich diversity of sea life that you see with a remotely operated vehicle. Yeah, so, you know, Papahanaumokuakea is actually a, a cultural voyaging scape. So our ancestors actually sailed up here on um, double-hauled voyaging canoes, and it was actually a training ground. So between the occupied uh, main Hawaiian islands and um, Nihua and Mokumanamana, the two uh, islands closest to the main Hawaiian islands, that was a voyaging and continues to be a voyaging training ground. So those who are training on voyaging canoes like Hokulea and Makali'i, that's like their rite of passage. So they have to voyage either from whatever island they're on, Oahu or Hawaii Island, and make their way up to the Northwest Hawaiian Islands utilizing ocean currents, you know, the sun, the moon, the, the constellations. So it is a continuing kind of cultural practice and um, it's amazing because we have so many young people who have had their this rite of passage. And that's one of the big things that we push in Papahana Mokuakea is to make sure that cultural practice is continued, maintained, and that Kanako O'ivi, Native Hawaiians, can access this Aina Akua, this sacred space where our ancestors practiced. And we have on board actually um, two voyagers from the Hokulea, Mahina, Lani, Cavalieri, and Daniel Kinzer. So it's so cool that that continuity of practice continues whether you're on a traditional va'a canoe or on a, a, you know, a boat, a vessel like the Nautilus. Holothurian. Mm -hmm. And also Mahina and Daniel are both actually behind us in the broadcasting studio doing an interaction. Nice. So. It's been awesome to have, you know, all of everyone on board to connect with communities and share what we're doing and give, especially youth, Hawaiian youth, like um, just an opportunity to see themselves in this work. And Absolutely. You know, just expanding those kind of options, career pathways um, for our, our Kanaka and local students from Hawaii. So important for them to see that there's, there's you know, options in science where you can weave cultural practice as well. I think there's probably a perception that to um, be in this field or to uh, secure a slot on this vessel, you need to be the top of your class with triple majors and three minors and all of that. And uh, uh, while all that's helpful, I think there's just this kind of unknown 
uh, thing that uh, I really can't put my finger on it that uh, helps people get into and succeed in this uh, sector. Um, and I know a lot of the video engineering interns are very surprised that they were selected. Mm -hmm. um, so I keep coming back to the make them say no. Uh, always apply for something you don't know what they're looking for. Yeah, I feel like I can definitely speak to that. I found out about the Science Communication Fellow application about like a month before it was due. And I had so many just like self-doubt thoughts and just like so many reasons why I was like, well, I don't know if, you know, I would be accepted. I think for me, a lot of it was like, I'm a very young teacher. This is only my third year of teaching. And I just felt very um, young <laughs> kind of coming into this experience. And I had a lot of people being really supportive and just encouraging me to apply. and. Like when I found out I even like had just gotten an interview, that was like so exciting and just so grateful for that opportunity. And like, um, yeah, I feel so lucky to I'll have this in. experience in fellowship. And then specifically when I found out that this was the expedition that I was going to be coming on and that I was coming out here to Papahanaumokuakea, I, that makes it like just so special. And I'm so grateful that this is the first experience I've had um, sailing and exploring and I just feel so lucky and so grateful. And I think that's important to kind of emphasize that there's multiple pathways, you know, to, to do this kind of work. Like you don't need a PhD, um, you know, necessarily to do this kind of amazing work. So that's one of, I think, the big messages we try to share um, it, at Papahanaumokuakeo is that, you know, not everybody's going to college. Um, there's other pathways to to be a part of the conservation world and to malama aina to take care of the natural environment around us and you also do opportunities like this you get to interact with people who are you know such rich subject matter experts um dr brennan there you know marine uh, and maritime archaeology is just an amazing field and so being able to learn from your shipmates and find out about the work they do. Uh, as a matter of fact, Mike, you've got uh, Robert, one of our RV pilots, down there in between his watches. He's looking up uh, models of the Akagi. Yeah, he was talking about that. <laughs> yeah. Well, and it, you know, it's not just you get to um, see what we do, but, but you guys get to participate in it, you know? I mean, this is not, th these expeditions are, you know, someone in doing archaeology on land can, can dig a, a hole mostly by themselves, but, you know, this this is a massive team effort. It takes all 49 people on board to do what we do, um, you know, so you guys are directly involved. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to share, too, um, we just got a message from my uncle actually who wanted to tell everyone thank you for you know sharing this experience and how he's hoping that um you know our telepresence and like this live stream specifically can help younger generations and yeah like i've got students that they're at school right now and they watch and they listen and just opening so many eyes to possibilities for what their future can look like and just how different their lives could end up being and I also wanted to just recognize too that we've got so many knowledgeable people on board with us and we also have like our scientists ashore our science chat that shares just so much knowledge and information with us and I'm so grateful that you know they're here with us and awake <laughs> I feel like every time we come on I see like the same people are in the chat with us and just sharing so much knowledge well I'm glad somebody's awake <laughs> <laughs> Our, uh, our audience is uh, very connected. Uh, yeah. I'll never forget, we were somewhere on the planet um, measuring the temperature. We have a temperature probe measuring the temperature coming out of a hydrothermal vent. And I think it was, uh, it was somebody on board, maybe Dr. Ballard, uh, thought that it was the highest temperature we've ever seen coming out of a hydrothermal vent. And about four or five minutes later, one of our viewers 
typed in and said, actually, I checked my notes, and seven years ago, at this site, you recorded a temperature that was four degrees hotter. <laughs> We've got so many viewers that drop just so many messages. We get so many messages that come in, like hundreds, and any kind of suggestions with identifications or any comments or anything like that, all of that's stored and saved and helps us. That's well, nice of your uncles able to join us. Yeah. And, uh, they must be so proud of you, Tori. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, he's, he's been watching, and I've been encouraging them to, like, you know, type in the chat when they're here. Nice. Um, just so I know that they're watching. Same thing with my students. Like, if y'all are in here watching, you can let me know. <laughs> Is your uncle a teacher also? Do you say you have a family full of teachers? Yeah, no, he's not a teacher. I have oh. um, a lot of aunts and cousins oh. that teach, mostly elementary school. So for a long time, everyone kind of was like, I think you should teach elementary school. And <laughs> I did like one internship with like second to fourth graders and it was fun. I loved hanging out with them after school, but it was really hard to like help them with their work. Like I, that's so hard. Teaching a child how to read, I just right. oh, so much respect for it. I give props to yeah. middle school and high school teachers. Oh. <laughs> middle school. You're dealing with a lot. Middle yeah. school. Yeah, especially. Yeah. Yeah. Just to jump in real quick, um, so Hannah, we're approaching waypoint five. Is that a another rock o'clock, or do you want to wait a little bit longer? If we get there, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I don't think we're gonna make it. You don't think we're gonna make it? I don't think we're it? gonna make it. <laughs> How far are we? Is this a Metallogorgia stacked on a Metallogorgia? Can we get a zoom in on that? 334 yep. meters away. Sure. 34 meters 300. away. 300. Oh, 300. 34. Okay, thanks. Yeah, we'll see. We'll go for a zoom. Not going in. For Val. Yeah, go for it. I'm not trying to go I think it's super two different fast stocks. You can see yeah. over. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. I can't hear you. Yeah, this is one mass. Huh? This is Metal Gorge just stacked on top of Metal Gorge, oh, really? I think. Keep going. Or it's one animal of two. With a break. That's yeah. really unusual. Can we get the middle part again as well? I yep. forgot to think of a picture of that. Interesting. Make get tighter if you want, or at least keep lasers in. All right. Thank you. Coming out. We have the sweetest message for Val in here. Um, someone says that they've been like loving watching us and they're amazed about how just like well everyone works together and it blows their mind and that they've been watching for four years and the first person they heard speak was Val and that they've been hooked ever since. That's great. <laughs> Way to go, I, Val. I was too, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, literally whenever she starts watch, uh, like she's usually the first like blue water watch. Yeah. They literally just sit in the lounge and listen to her talk <laughs> and I just like write down stuff that she says like I feel like I need to follow her with a voice recorder and just like everything that she says I'm like wow that's so smart like you're so smart isn't she all well wait where is she from Maryland maybe she's that's where she Michigan. lives now oh yeah she lives in Maryland now but yeah from Michigan but she's also very accessible you know, so she's so willing to share what she knows, which mm -hmm. is just really awesome. 